All right, looks like the recording is, spot, is started. So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here today with us for the fourth session of our monthly School Garden Leadership Training webinar series for the 2021 and 22 school year. We're excited to welcome lots of returning garden champions from across the state of Florida. This session is titled Maintenance Meetup and we will be covering topics ranging from disease and pest management to seasonal garden upkeep and how to cultivate community partners. My name is Tiffany Torres and I'm the State School Garden Specialist with Florida Agriculture in the Classroom and I'll be facilitating today. We have a lot to dig into together, so let's get started. And first off, I wanna quickly go over some Zoom housekeeping tips. So viewing modes can be found in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You may need to press the escape button to exit full screen and view some of those options. And we recommend using side-by-side -side speaker view during the webinar. And you'll notice that there's a divider at the center of your screen, which you can toggle left and right to make the PowerPoint bigger or smaller for you. And at any point, if you wanna see who is in the room with us today, you can click the participants button. We'll be using the chat feature throughout the webinar, including for our Q&A session. And lastly, please be sure to mute your audio and video throughout the webinar for recording purposes. You will have a chance to interact with one another live and unmute yourselves during the Q&A session at the end from 4.30 to 5. And closed captioning is available and enabled. All webinars are available on our YouTube channel. And if you would like CEUs, those are available upon request as well. So one of our goals with this series is to continue networking opportunities across the state of Florida between educators and school garden leaders. And if you haven't done so already, we encourage you to please go ahead and share your name, the organization or school that you're affiliated with, your county, and maybe something that you're grateful for this season in the chat box. And remember, you can also rename yourself and share your pronoun preferences by clicking the three dots in the upper right-hand corner above your video. I also wanna take a moment and pause and acknowledge and give gratitude to the past and current indigenous and native communities of the land on which our work with school gardens occurs. If you're unfamiliar with the native communities of your region, we encourage you to take a moment to type your location into the website that we're sharing in the chat box. Uh, we know that this website is not a comprehensive list, but it can be a useful tool to deepen our awareness and connection to the indigenous communities of the land on which we all live, learn, work, eat, and play. And so as we're learning about one another, I want to take a moment to introduce you to the co-hosts of this webinar series. The series is hosted in partnership between Florida Agriculture in the Classroom and the University of Florida IFAS Extension Family Nutrition Program. And a little bit about us, Florida Agriculture in the Classroom is a statewide nonprofit organization funded by the specialty license plate, the Ag Tag. Florida Ag in the Classroom connects kids to healthy food and Florida agriculture through educational resources, teacher professional development, grants, and other farm school programming. And we have a vision to ensure that every student in pre-K through 12 education in Florida is aware of and appreciates agriculture and natural resources in our state. You can see some of our services here on the left of the slide and our contact info on the right. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We are happy to support your gardening journey. And our second partner in this series is the University of Florida IFAS Extension Family Nutrition Program who helps limited resource families in Florida access more nutrition foods, nutritious food choices on a budget and adopt healthier eating and physical activity habits to reduce the risk of obesity and chronic disease. And FMP or uh, the Family Nutrition Program is currently serving in 40 different counties throughout the state. They've been doing so since 1996 and providing free nutrition education to their partners. And they have lots of free resources to help uh, support you. So please visit their website as well. And so a little bit about why we're all here. Uh, this webinar series is designed for Florida school garden leaders of all levels to build gardening confidence foster collaboration among leaders and strengthen garden programs for long-term success. So we do this by touching on the three spheres that we found most helpful in sustaining school garden programs, which are gardening knowledge, curriculum connections, and leadership skills. And our ultimate goal in this series is to grow garden leaders, not just garden leaders. So remember that you can track these symbols on the slides as we go through our presentation together. And what are we gonna dive into today? So our agenda uh, from 4.30, uh, our agenda for, to, for today from 3.30 to 
is to cover some gardening knowledge, uh, including common garden pests, preventing crop disease, and seasonal garden upkeep strategies. We'll also give you some tips on how to teach about pests and some curriculum connections that might be useful in your classroom. And then we'll move on to cultivating healthy community partnerships and provide you with some resources that promote your garden program. And first up, we have our guest speaker, Jana Bugs Miller. Uh, Jana is a 4-H entomology volunteer with UFI IFIS Extension. She also has an awesome Instagram page uh, that I highly encourage you all to join uh, where she documents a lot of the bugs that she finds in the Panhandle region. And so Jana's gonna talk about pest management in the school garden and she'll be available after uh, afterwards from 435. So if you have any questions, please chat, type them into the chat box. We'll take uh, note of them and then we will answer them all at the end. So take it away, Jana. You're still muted. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, unfortunately, I had way too much to talk about, so I did try to condense all of the things I wanted to speak about. But I wanted to mention the three categories that I put all insects, bugs, any kind of critter you find in your garden. I categorize them as, as pests, helpers, and visitors. Because, you know, we know what pests are. They're going to be things that destroy our plants, um, be it the vegetables, the fruit, the, the leaf, whatever, whatnot. Our helpers are going to be our pollinators, the people or the, the creatures that eat the bad bugs. And visitors are going to be um, pests in, in other circumstances that aren't necessarily going to bother us too much. And I would consider those to be the larva of butterfly, for example, like if you encounter monarchs in your garden, or um, perhaps uh, tortoise beetles. If anyone has seen like a brightly colored beetle, in their garden before. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be harmful. And um, if you have any questions about things of that sort in the, uh, towards the end of the conversation, I would love to hear it in the Q&A. But um, on our next slide, um, I wanted to talk about the helpers. And so each one I'm going to speak and we're going to click and see the photos of, that I've selected for each one. So our first one, we have butterflies. Um, the next we have bees, and as you'll see here, this is actually a swarm of natural occurring honeybees. Honeybees are not na actually native to the United States, but they do still swarm naturally. So you may see them um, occur like this in your garden, and that's completely okay. Call your extension office and someone will come remove them safely and relocate them so that they can be used to benefit other gardens. In addition, we have wasps. And this is kind of controversial, but wasps are one of the most beneficial bugs to have in your garden. Not only do they pollinate, they also um, eat a lot of bad bugs. And in the next slide, we can see that they do that by um, parasitizing uh, the larva of harmful pests. So what we see here is actually the pupa of wasps that have um, come out of the body <laughs> of this caterpillar and it will not be coming um, be an adult and it will not be um, reproducing next year. So you will see more control in your garden for the following year. In addition, we have a couple different assassin bugs. This is uh, clearly one that I found um, eating a type of beetle that does um, feed on leafy greens. And then the next one um, is called a jagged ambush bug. And these are actually very, very tiny, um, but they also will kind of, um, capture any kind of bug that they find that's pretty that's harmful for your garden. Uh, the next one that we have is a um, stink bug. <laughs> so people don't normally think about stink bugs as being beneficial. And you know, you might think of them as like just a stinky visitor. Um, it's best just to leave them alone because they are a little stinky. Um, the smell can actually be like uh, sickeningly sweet. And um, Swedish, they are called um, yeah, the Swedish word for them actually calls them um, a berry fart <laughs> because the smell is sickeningly sweet. So if you smell something like that, it smells like a stink bug and it's gonna be okay for your garden because they're gonna eat pests. And then in addition, we have ladybugs and ladybugs um, are voracious aphid eaters. So if you have any aphids, hope that you get some ladybugs in your garden too. 
And then we have a couple spiders. Um, we have orb weavers. Those are going to be very beneficial to your garden. And then also, this is a, a type of predatory spider that's very common in Florida called a state spider. And um, they basically will, they don't have webs, so they can actually be found on your plants and they are completely harmless and very safe and good for your, for your garden. And then finally, we have mantids. Um, and they're always very fun to visit. But um, if you have any more questions about helpers, I'd be happy to answer more of those um, in our Q&A session. So I'd like to start out with some of my universal pest control options. And what I say is manual search and destroy or scouting. <laughs> we like to learn about our, um, it's very important to learn about your, your plants and find out what likes to eat them and just know the signs of infestation. Um, I like to put in plants that um, are, are plant wildflowers around my garden because that will lead birds to my garden, that will lead pollinators to my garden, which is beneficial for creating vegetation later and like fruiting of my, of my um, crops. Um, but with bird-friendly landscaping, you can also ensure that the birds are gonna be very hungry and probably eat any bad bugs they find in your garden, which is very beneficial. Something we can do to attract more birds is to have a flowing water source. Um, people will often put out bird baths, but bird baths can actually cause a lot of disease in birds. So we really encourage you, if you do have a bird bath, you should change it daily. And if not daily, then at least as often as you can and clean the container itself, because it can really cause a lot of disease in birds. Um, um, in addition, um, just making sure that your garden is going to be free of pesticides because we want to have the good bugs. The next thing I wanted to talk about is Faculus thurnigeniasis, which I cannot actually pronounce and do not uh, quote me on that at all, but we call it BT. Um, I just, I mostly put on quotes from a website that I found here because um, this is just information I took straight from the, um, from um, the, uh, an education website because um, I'm not a scientist on this one, but I know that this is a natural um, bacteria you can put in your soil that will prevent um, basically, it, it will infest uh, larvae and whatnot and cause them so that they can't um, grow any further and they wouldn't ingest um, any of your plant material and whatnot. Um, if you want to learn more, please feel free to look at the National Pesticide Information Center. Um, and this is probably one of the most for a school garden because we are wanting to make sure that we have it child safe and like safe for um, kids to be able to go play around and, and, and be involved with. This is probably the, the highest form of control that I would really recommend is BT. Because the number one thing with um, control methods for our garden is child safe usually means pollinator safe. And we want to encourage children to be gentle with, with, our, with our garden and with animals. We don't necessarily want to kid, send kids out to go and to stomp on anything they see. That's why we want to learn about the helpers as well as the pets. And something we really like to, um, to encourage um, with UF and IFAS is to uh, establish action thresholds. And we don't have quite enough time to go really deep into that subject, but I find it to be very important. So what we call is IPM, which um, the acronym I cannot remember at this moment, but I think Tiffany will be able to tell us more about that later. Um, I like to say, don't count your mishaps before they haps, which basically means don't start planning for disaster before something happens. We're, we're gardening small and it's, it's helpful to also have the education experience of being like, oh, something is happening. I know how to fix this and I can teach my kids to come along with me on this journey to fix it as well. So, um, and oh, and then a very important thing too is I always say flat hands. It's one of my number one things I tell the kids whenever we're doing bug club. And also I have a, a three-year-old and I've taught him very distinctly flat hands and it works very well. Kids know that they should not grasp things or squish things whenever they're in their hands. Um, so some of the common pests I wanna discuss is gonna be mostly, I'm gonna discuss caterpillars and aphids, but um, caterpillars are going to be uh, hornworms, loopers, armyworms, cutworms. There's so many different names for them, but really the biggest, um, there's two different uh, types of damage you'll really be seeing from them. And it's pretty much either a complete decimation of your, of your leafy greens um, or holes throughout the plant itself. And so loopers and, and armyworms especially, um, and we'll be seeing this in the video that we um, will be showing a little bit later, 
that um, they will be creating these really distinctive holes. And the hornworms, on the other hand, there's usually one or two of them at a time, and usually on your tomato plant exclusively, and perhaps on peppers. And those you can very easily see whenever they are occurring and just go grab them and take them away. <laughs> um, so on this next one, um, I wanted to show some pictures of some loopers. And uh, so a looper is a type of, is a type of inchworm. And um, they will be, and you'll see, find them in several numbers. They'll, they'll be in large groups. Next, we have hornworm. And hornworms, like I said, they're pretty large and they're usually one or two at a time. This one is a, is a late instar, and instar means like it's growth cycle because um, caterpillars actually, even though they have soft skin to them, they actually do shed their exoskeleton just like um, other kind of hard isopod, um, arthropods molt. Um, caterpillars also molt. So each molt is called an instar, basically. And this is about the final instar of a hornworm. And once it gets to this size, it's, it can kill an entire tomato plant in basically a day. And if you kind of let it get to this point, that means probably we're not checking our garden every day. Um, we're not usually in the garden at night, but an easy way to catch hornworms is to go out with a UV flashlight, like a black light flashlight, and you can find them basically glowing on the plant. It's pretty, it's pretty fun. Um, <laughs> especially for kids, but I know that that's not something, you don't usually have kids at school at night. <laughs> um, the next one we have armyworms and cutworms. And so armyworms, cutworms, loopers, these are the ones that I feel you'll find in the most numbers, um, and especially on um, your cabbages and um, other types of plants, which I'm gonna discuss in the next slide, but um, in addition to that uh, larvae pest, you'll also find leaf miners. And leaf miners are actually going to be found probably on your tomato plants. And they have um, pretty, you won't see them themselves, but what you can see is these little lines and swirls all around your, um, on your leaves here. And uh, that's actually the caterpillar mining through the leaf itself. And they're pretty easy to control in my opinion. You literally just squish them <laughs> inside the leaf and then nothing is harmed, <laughs> but, um, We'll go on to the next slide. <laughs> so this is, I wanted to talk about brassicas. Brassicas are, um, are cabbages. And we have, so like, whenever I learned about that brassicas were most cabbages, I was very, very impressed by this fact. So I just really wanted to point it out. But there's one species called brassica oloracea. <laughs> um, it's cabbage, mustard greens, kale, collards, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Robbie, uh, it's an amazing amount of different um, vegetables that are actually all the same thing. And so you'll find loopers on pretty much all of those and cutworms, and they're just susceptible to almost everything. And it's just very obvious whenever we start seeing damage on them because we'll be looking for the holes in the leaf. And so um, I wanted to uh, point out that this is a good way to find also the, um, the, the eggs. Eggs for loopers will be found on the underside of leaves, and they are usually a perfect circle. Um, so because they are moths, they're also um, Lepidopteras, which is the family of butterflies and moths. So all butterflies, all moths are actually Lepidoptera. So moths, even though we consider them pests a lot of times, are very closely related to butterflies, and they have very similar eggs. They're all kind of a perfect circle. But with moths, you will especially see them in large numbers. And if you do see that, it's probably safe to go ahead and remove them from the leaf, if not um, remove the leaf itself, which we'll discuss in um, the video we'll be watching later. So um, some caterpillar control methods, follow the universal control methods that I mentioned above, which is just gonna be knowing the plants and the signs of it and removing the, the, the pest manually. Um, if you're having some serious issues or if like you can't, if you have a larger garden, um, floating row covers is a really fantastic option. And floating row covers is basically um, going to be like a soft covering that you lay over your plants so that they can still photosynthesize and get water and whatnot. Um, but it will kind of block out any pests from going inside. And this I 
usually they assume that you're also using um, DP in this kind of situation um, because it's going to be pests from getting inside and laying eggs versus like coming like anything that's impugating the soil and whatnot. Um, pheromone traps is another good option. Pheromone traps are going to be things that you use to attract like um, usually the, the, the female scent. Um, so males will go straight to the pheromone trap and basically be unable to reproduce. And they can be a little pricey, so some, sometimes you avoid them. So the hornworm control methods I mentioned before, um, the black, use black light to find them. Uh, they are really good feeders for your reptiles that you might have in your classroom. Um, they're also great for fishing. And also you'll commonly see these um, with with the, the pupa of wasp that I had shown before, those little white cocoons that stick out of them. Um, wasps tend to really decimate the species if, if, if the wasps are allowed to live. <laughs> so my least favorite is armyworms and cutworms. They are so, so hard to control. Um, they stay in large numbers, just like the loopers. And uh, they are really are found in Florida year round. Um, the best method of control here is once again going to be uh, the universal control methods and um, bird friendly landscaping. I can't stress that enough. Um, but um, floating row covers would be your, your worst case scenario whenever dealing with them. Here's a couple more egg examples I just wanted to show. And um, so uh, the cutworm. Uh, <laughs> I did want to mention that removing uh, cutworms and loopworms actually in this man um, by manual removal can be pretty gross because there are so many of them. It's, it's just really overwhelming. Um, so uh, I'm going to speak in the, in, in the video we watch later. Uh, you, know, you don't want your kids just to go out there and start squishing like um, hornworm or uh, like larvae and whatnot. So it's really best if they kind of point out the the, the damage being caused here as soon as possible. And then you kind of make the decision of what to do with them afterwards. I would probably not mention that, you know, you're gonna probably kill all of them or anything like that. <laughs> so the leaf miner, they just they create those distinctive trails that I had mentioned. Uh, they're not generally too harmful. And actually leaf miners can be beetles, they can be flies, they can be um, moths. Uh, there's really just almost every type of larva of um, arthropod has um, a type of, of um, vegetable miner. <laughs> and um, the hosts are really very large range and can be pretty much any, one, any kind of plant that you have that has a vegetable to it. Um, once you see them, the leaf itself, you can kind of see where the, there's a darkest mark of, of the leaf or perhaps like you can tell where the that either the front or the, the top or the bottom of the trail is and just squish right there with your fingers just between the leaves and um, the, the larvae will be will be killed and no, no harm, no foul. <laughs> so that's the identification again. Um, yes, chemical controls are not recommended for school gardens. So aphids. Uh, there's just such a significant amount of different types of aphids that they're just like clearly going to be masses of them um, just sucking the juice out of your plants. <laughs> um, they're generally found on plant stems and leaves in pretty large numbers. And you can oftentimes see um, ants farming them for uh, their secretions, which are called honeydew. It's uh, very sugary and the ants will basically instead of like um, being predators as they normally are, they will just feed off of the ants, which is pretty interesting because we also make our own farms. So what does that make us with ants? I think that's pretty fascinating. <laughs> but um, however, I, we're not supposed to like aphids. <laughs> One control method that's pretty easy to do with aphids, if you're not squeamish, is you can simply, um, they don't move very easily and just moving them can, can damage their body as it is. So it's pretty easy to just squish them as well. And they're very small. Um, you'll also, we'll show those in the, the video later. And Jenna, I hate to interrupt you, but we're running a little short on time. So I okay. think what we'll do is go ahead and uh, play the video during the Q&A session for anybody who's <laughs> able to stick around and we'll give you all a link to that as well. Um, and then we're gonna move into Molly's portion 
And if you have any questions for Dana or want to dive deeper into these subjects, please stick around for our Q&A session. Yep. So thanks, Dana. Awesome. Um, and I think that's about it for us. And so let me just go ahead and fast forward here. We have a couple more aphid pictures, neem oil. Here's our video. And then actually I'm gonna talk real quick about a couple of things. Uh, just have a couple of quick slides about some curriculum. So in the video that you'll see later, um, Jana actually talks about some techniques for how to bring the garden inside of the classroom. And I wanted to share a couple of pictures from uh, this is Westwood Christian School in Live Oak, Florida. They actually did just that. They wrote a grant with Florida Agriculture in the Classroom to get materials so that they could study um, the bugs that are in their school garden. And the goal of their grant was that students will understand the multi-purpose role of insects, their responsibility for crop success and failure. They will explore insects as pollinators, decomposers, pests, and parasites. They will collect specimens for study and display. I think they made these bug boxes on their own. And overall, they'll gain an appreciation for insects and the role that they play in food production. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and write a grant for something like that, we encourage you to do so. Um, getting tools that are appropriately sized is another uh, tip that we recommend. So you can see that there's you know, medium sized magnifying glasses for indoor, some plastic ones for outdoor use. Um, critter carriers is another thing that you might wanna get for indoor classroom use and get interactive with it. Um, shake the bush is an activity that we encourage where you put a sheet over a plant, shake it and see what bugs <laughs> come out on the sheet. Um, and then, you know, get creative with it too. So bug binoculars is another, you know, age appropriate for smaller students uh, activity where you make, you know, bug, bug binoculars out of, um, out of toilet paper tube kind of things. And overall, we just wanna encourage you to be curious uh, with your students as you explore the world of bugs. And here's just a couple of quick resources that you might wanna look into as well. So stemming up for gardening, uh, we have a lesson that called What's Bugging Me? That is for grades seven through 12. And it comes with an IPM PowerPoint that you can use in your classroom. We also have a lot of information that dives deeper into IPM on the Grow to Learn Guide, uh, which you can access through the Family Nutrition Programs website. And this is a book that was written by Jarrett C. Daniels, Insects, Bugs, and Kids. Uh, it's a really fun book and he is an entomology professor at UF. So that's a fun book that we recommend too. And then of course, like I said, keep it interactive and do activities outside whenever possible. So you can see this picture in the lower left is a bug bingo card. So it has some general categories um, that students can look for on scavenger hunts when they're outside in the garden. And now I will hand it over to Molly Jameson. She's gonna talk a little bit more about disease and plant pathology as well as some garden maintenance tips. And Molly is the Sustainable Agriculture and Community Food Systems Agent at UFX's Extension Leon County office. Thanks for being with us, Molly. Uh, thanks so much, Tiffany. Okay, so um, we talked about pests. So now of course we should talk also about diseases which can affect your plants in your garden. Um, the big thing to keep in mind is that, you know, the trying to identify what's going on is going to be the first step in, in what to do about a problem. Um, and sometimes you'll see something and you'll think it could be a uh, something living that's affecting your plant. But a lot of times it could actually just be an abiotic disease that might look like it could be a actual living thing affecting it. Um, so physical damage, um, you know, mower damage, herbicide injury, and then a lot of imbalances with um, fertility, such as, you know, too much or too little nutrition, temperature, um, water stress, uh, not enough light, too much light, these kind of disorders are going to be abiotic and they won't be from a actual plant disease. Next slide. Um, okay, uh, so say abiotic examples, um, you can have cold damage. So you look at that plant, um, you might think it could be some sort of disease or insect affecting it, uh, but it really was just, it, you know, it got too cold for that particular plant. Another example is a, a blossom end rot. So you look at that tomato, it looks like it could be a disease, but it's actually um, from a calcium deficiency. Um, so it's just real important to try to identify what's going on. 
Um, and so kind of the, the, the rule for a disease is that you're gonna have this disease triangle. So you're gonna have to have both the pathogen itself um, and then a susceptible host. Um, so, you know, some, you might have a pathogen, but you could have a certain type of plant that's not affected by that pathogen. So you're not gonna get the disease. Um, and then of course, like the environment. So um, we were in Florida, it's hot and humid, and we have to worry a lot about diseases for this reason, um, because if you have the disease itself and you have, you know, a, there's so many diverse things that can grow in a garden. So definitely could end up getting a pathogen that fits the host. And then with our heat and our humidity, um, that brings it together. And that's where we end up getting disease in our garden. Next slide. Uh, okay, so what is a disease? So it's actually a disruption of normal plant function that's caused by the interaction between the plant and a pathogen, which is characterized um, by identifiable signs and symptoms. And in the next slide, we'll see what that actually means. Um, uh, so basically, well, a pathogen is an organism capable of affecting the physiological processes. Um, and we're gonna have three different main types that will be causing these problems. You're gonna have the fungi, the bacteria, and the viruses. And um, so the fungi is actually gonna be 85% of plant diseases will be from a fungal source. Um, and they actually, most of them will reproduce by spores. And these are gonna be dispersed by the wind, uh, splashing of water, your tools. Um, so why it's important to sanitize. And of course, just human activity in the garden can help spread these spores. Uh, they're gonna enter through natural, op natural openings in the plant, um, different wound wounds that the plant might have. So maybe a weaker plant could be more susceptible. And these are gonna include your molds, your mildews and your, your mushrooms, like the fruiting bodies of the fungi themselves. And here is an example of fungal spores. Um, so they can really generate um, through high moisture and humidity. And we're all in Florida. We, we definitely know we get high moisture and humidity pretty often in our state. Um, all right, so bacteria, uh, that's the other uh, culprit. It's uh, smaller than fungi. It's only one celled. Uh, they reproduce by cell division. They are also dispersed by water, rain, um, you know, poor sanitation of your tools, um, infected plants, and of course, just us moving through our garden. Uh, they also will enter through like natural openings and wounds of your plant. Uh, they are much more contagious than bacteria, so they're a little less common, but they can spread really quick. So if you start to see like a bacteri bacterial disease in your garden, it's actually just real important to go ahead and remove that plant uh, so it doesn't affect other, other plants in your garden. Um, and then phytoplasma um, is, is a bacteria type um, problem and it does require an insect host uh, to get in, into your, your plants. Um, so uh, fungi, they cause the majority of plant diseases, um, but bacteria um, can definitely be a problem too, and they're very infectious. And you know, both of these are gonna be highly promoted with high temperatures and high humidity. There are some that you know, like it, like cooler weather as well, but you know, the, the spring and the summer are gonna be where we see a lot of these problems um, in Florida. Um, okay, the last uh, kind of group is the viruses. Uh, so they're real small. Um, they have to have a living host to reproduce. And, and they're, they're usually spread by insects themselves. Um, so, you know, mites, nematodes, um, that kind of thing. And they enter through the wounds that are made uh, by, you know, by these insects generally. Uh, okay, so here's the signs and symptoms. Um, so a sign, it's actually gonna be the pathogen itself. So it's the different spore, um, the fruiting body, the mushroom, the conch. So it's actually the, the organism itself. And then the symptoms is just gonna be kind of how the plant expresses that disease. So that's gonna be different leaf spots, um, patches, or if it like the plants dying back. Um, so by <clears throat> kind of keeping this in mind, it can help you to identify what's going on in your garden. Uh, okay, so just a couple examples of signs. Um, so the actual fungal mycelium itself, uh, the fruiting bodies, uh, for bacteria, there's actually like a, an ooze that can, if you, if you cut the stem of um, the plant, you'll, you can see this bacterial streaming. So that's the actual uh, bacteria itself. And it can also help you identify that it's bacteria, not fungal. 
Um, and then the, the viruses actually really don't have any signs, um, but you'll see the symptoms on the plant. Um, here are some examples of signs. Uh, so here's powdery mildew fungus. Um, so that's actually the, you know, the, the fungus itself that you're seeing. Um, and so, yeah, it's basically that is the actual organism when you're seeing it as a sign. Um, here's the sclerotia of a uh, certain type of fungus that can affect a tomato. Again, it's the actual organism itself. Um, and here is that streaming. So this is bacterial wilt of tomato. Um, and if you suspect you might have this problem, again, it's, it's really good to just go ahead and get that plant out of your garden so it doesn't spread. Um, but if you, if you chop that stem and put it in some water, you can actually sometimes see this streaming um, coming into the water and that's how you'll know it's bacterial. Um, oh, and another thing is bad smell. Um, so if you, if you just smell a real weird, weird odor in your garden and you're having these kind of problems, then that might be a sign that it's a bacterial disease. Um, okay, so yep, signs, actual plant pathogen symptoms, it's how they're expressed. Here is a symptom. So we got just a, a, a distinct lesion, like a leaf spot. Um, so it's not the actual pathogen, um, but it's causing, you know, it's, the, the plant is expressing their, that, you know, that organism in their vicinity by creating these spots. Um, and then there are things that can be very confusing. So, you know, you look at that uh, palm leaf, you might think that could be like a virus, but it's actually a, could be a potassium deficiency. Um, and then, you know, this kind of problem in, in grass, um, that can be an insect damage, and though you might think it could have been a disease. Um, okay, so again, with symptoms, so you're gonna see these like fruit spots and fruit rots. Um, that are a sign that there could be a disease there, but it doesn't mean that it's the actual organism yourself that you're seeing on, on the plant. Um, and here is wilt. Um, so wilting foliage um, and discolored, discolored xylem, which is like the how a plant gets water through its insides. Um, you're gonna be able to see these type of problems that are gonna lead you possibly down the path uh, that you have a bacterial or fungal fungal problem going on in your garden. And here is virus. Um, so you'll see these weird mottling, um, you know, symptoms of viruses actually do look kind of interesting on plants. Um, but yeah, definitely not a, a great sign. And again, they, they can be vectored by insects very easily. They can carry these viruses that can infect your plants. Oh, here is some more of virus um, symptoms. So they can cause a lot of stunting and distorted growth in your plants. So not, not good, you just end up seeing this. Um, ring spots, again, can look kind of cool, um, but these are definitely symptoms of that you have a viral problem going on in your garden. Um, okay, so a little a bit about what can we do? Uh, so that's you as your, a gardener. Don't know what to do. Uh, well, first you got to keep in mind that there is the disease triangle. So how could we break, you know, one part of this triangle in order to stop the problem? Um, so we either have to exclude the pathogen itself. Um, we need to use disease resistant plants. Um, and then we also need to alter the plant environment. Um, so, you know, it can be really hard to do e any of these things. And really the best way to manage disease is gonna be all about uh, preventing the disease from occurring. Um, and so Jana mentioned um, integrated pest management. It's really just kind of thinking of the steps you're gonna take um, from, uh, the, from kind of a, a bottom up kind of approach. So you really wanna start with just different kind of cultural things you can do and then start to work your way up through the integrated pest management triangle of physical things you can do and biological. And then you wanna think of using different chemicals as really your, your, last, your last option. Um, so by starting really nice, healthy plants, then you can avoid using any type of chemicals in your, in your garden. Um, so here are some of the good cultural practices. Um, so it really is all about prevention. So if you, especially if you feel like you've had issues in your garden already, then you really wanna make sure that you're getting like pest resistant varieties. 
And this can actually be, if you're buying seeds, a lot of times it'll say on the seed pack itself, um, what kind of diseases it might be, um, you know, helps you resist against. Um, avoiding planting out of season is also very important. Um, and you really want to help help scout for different pests and diseases regularly, because if you see a problem early, you know, you can remove that plant um, and that can help you really preserve the rest of your, your garden space. And also have really good uh, garden sanitation. So remove any um, weeds that might be right there that could also be a host for a problem that you might be having. Um, be sure to clean pruning tools, especially if you suspect it's a uh, fungal or, or bacterial type of problem, because then you can just be carrying those spores onto your next plant. Um, and really try not to work when, the, when it's really wet out there, because that can really help um, spread those spores. Uh, use a crop rotation. So that's really just using, uh, I know Jana mentioned like brassicas. Well, if you are growing the same exact type of uh, crop like brassicas over and over again, then you're going to be like breeding those same diseases and pests um, in your garden. And so by growing a different type of plant family, you can help really break those different um, pest and disease cycles. So that's a real important thing to do. And then another really big one, especially in Florida, is allowing air circulation. Um, so, you know, maybe prune the lower leaves of your plants, make sure you have proper spacing. Um, and so the, the more airflow that gets in, the less, um, especially fungal problems that you'll have in your garden. Um, all right, so here's just a couple examples of exclusion. You know, you can sanitize your, your, your tools. Um, it's gonna help you prevent problems in the first place. And also really make sure you start with healthy, um, either, you know, disease resistant or disease free seeds. Um, or different transplants that do not already have infection on them when you plant them. Um, uh, here's just an example of some disease resistant species and varieties. So you see these beans are actually uh, rust resistant. Um, and then uh, this is just a sun patient's flower, um, but they have those that are say downy mildew resistant. Um, so definitely important if you've already had disease problems in your garden. And uh, this is more of the physical, cultural type of things you can do. Just make sure you irrigate fertilize um, appropriately. Um, you know, so a lot of water, really wet soil um, can help to lead to diseases over time. Um, you, you know, you wanna make sure that you have good drainage. Uh, this is where raised bed gardening can really be effective. Uh, mulch is really great because it can help um, reduce the splashing from the soil up to your plant that splashes those spores around. Um, and then, of course, you want to use pesticides preventively and, you know, really kind of keep in mind that if you have a bacterial um, or fungal problem, uh, it's, it's you really kind of have to think about removing that plant and thinking of things you can do in the future to prevent that disease in the first place, because it's real hard to control once you already have the problem. Um, OK, I am going to move in and talk a little bit about seasonal garden upkeep. And uh, these two actually are pretty closely related because uh, a lot of different things you do to keep your plants healthy are gonna help to discourage um, different diseases in your garden. Um, so here are just a couple um, gardens from around. So that, that top right, that one is, you know, end of summer, time to clean up. You know, you, some of those, I think those are tomatoes in there. Um, they might be har harboring some kind of disease. So of course you wanna make sure that you, you get any disease debris out of your garden. In the middle, um, you know, that's just kind of displaying good plant spacing. So, you know, by, by having plants too close together, that can encourage um, less airflow and, and more problems. Um, and so, you know, just making sure that you have good sanitation and you're keeping up with your garden maintenance can help. Um, so, you know, when you're getting started, of course, you want to have a garden plan, um, but it also really helps to kind of write down your garden task by the month. Uh, can help keep you on task and making sure that you're doing all the things to keep your garden healthy um, and really keep track of what's going on in your garden. You know, not only what varieties you actually you liked or your, your class liked, um, but what grew well and what kind of insects and diseases you're, you're seeing um, can really help you kind of learn and become a better gardener as you go along. Um, again, mulch, really awesome thing to use um, in your, your garden. It's going to help um, provide organic matter, but also can help reduce um, different types of weed problems. Um, it can help moderate soil temperature. Um, it can keep fruit from, from getting on the soil to help them keep down the rotting um, that could happen once they are ready. 
Um, so definitely just a really great practice is to use mulch in the garden and, and keep it coming regularly and can add organic matter. Uh, real, I think I'm getting a little maybe close on time, um, but uh, cold protection. Uh, I know we're, I'm up here in Tallahassee. We actually got close to freezing recently. Um, and so, if, and if you can use something like a frost cloth, you can actually get your temperature up about six to eight degrees, and that can really make a difference um, for our gardens here in Florida. Um, so that's 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 one really important thing to 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 have in your garden arsenal is some frost cloth, especially if you're in the north part of Florida. Um, and you know, you can use um, also little greenhouses can help that um, to just keep your uh, garden protected in the cold. A uh, big important thing though, when using frost cloth, uh, you don't wanna have, um, you, don't, you, you have to make sure that you're capturing the heat that's coming off the earth. And so you don't wanna just put it over a plant, tie it at the stem, because all that heat's gonna go right around um, that frost cloth and, and go out into the atmosphere. So really just make sure that you're covering that plant um, all the way to the ground to hold in that heat. Uh, shade cloth, of course, most of the time in Florida, it's hot. Um, and so, especially when your plants are really young, a little bit of shade cloth, that's about 40 to 60% um, density. So you see that black stuff on, on the ground in that picture, that can really help, um, you know, keep your plants from getting overheated, um, in, especially when they're really young or when it's getting above about 90 degrees. So shade cloth is definitely your friend to extend your season. I think that might, oh, no, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, caging and trellising. Um, this is really great for keeping your fruiting crops, especially in the spring, off the ground. It can also help you um, pack more kind of into that garden, but do it in a, in a good way so that you're not encouraging different, those pests and diseases by having things too close together. Um, so definitely investing in some, some trellising to, to keep things off the ground and to improve your spacing um, is, is great for gardening. Just a couple more examples. Got some squash, um, so that's some uh, spinach, um, I don't know, fake spinach anyway, um, but keep, keep your garden organized. Easier to harvest too. Uh, same kind of thing with staking and caging. Um, helps to really support your fruiting crops, especially, um, and can just do, it can help them uh, have better air circulation for sure. That might be my last slide. Yes. Okay. That was. Thank you, Molly. That was a really informative presentation on managing disease and what to do for seasonal garden upkeep. And so now we're going to move into cultivating community partnerships. Um, just like we maintain our gardens, we need to maintain our relationships too. So we're going to have Emily Grant, who is a food system specialist uh, with the U UFI Fist Extension Family Nutrition Program, tell us a little bit more about that. Take the family. Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, you can head to the next slide. So just like uh, Tiffany said, we know how important it is to um, maintain the physical space um, as, just as important as it is to maintain the, the people that we have involved in the garden. There takes a lot of hands to make um, a garden really thrive. So these um, principles of engagement, I'm sure are things that many of you are already doing um, when you're cultivating and, and building those uh, community partners. So a couple that I want to highlight um, that I think are important is when you're reaching out to a partner, possibly for an ask for a donation, um, really listen if they're unable to to donate exactly what you um, are hoping maybe to receive, and maybe they can help in, a, in another way. Um, we know that building trust is really important when it comes to partnership building. And so that can come in the form of being really communicative, um, sharing pictures from things that are happening at your, at your garden, um, and being really uh, reciprocal when it comes to uh, including the people who are giving their time or their energy uh, to your garden and really uh, having a sense of gratitude as well. You can go back one slide. Yeah, thank you. So um, some things that, that you all are likely doing um, that I think can be really helpful in your space is inviting partners to events. And so those could look like if you're doing a garden build or you're having a planting at a beginning part of the season or even mid season, 
Um, if you're having uh, maintenance, which requires, as we know, ongoing need um, to have kind of maintenance meetups or even maintenance parties, make it sound a little bit more fun. Um, this could also be in the form of a harvest or a tasting party. Um, and this picture here that you can see is from my area at Sug Middle. And um, the adults are able to come after uh, school hours on the weekends and, and have ongoing um, maintenance upkeep. And so um, sharing that in a newsletter or on social media is a, is a great way to, uh, to kind of give thanks um, and let people know what you're up to. I know that I really, really love receiving handwritten cards. And a couple of these here um, are from Kelly Wilson, who got some thank you notes from students for, uh, for the work that she was able to help provide in um, the Southwest Florida region. So a thank you note can go a really long way. Um, you can also make it even bigger and have an event. I know with COVID, it's been more challenging to have in-person events, um, but you can see in this picture below, this was um, a end of the year party um, that was thrown for, uh, for partners and for anyone who was involved at the garden. And the uh, teacher made a wonderful cake. Um, so it can be, it can be small, it can be big, but that gratitude is, um, is really important to, uh, to kind of give thanks to the partners involved. So a couple of tips for asking for donations. I know that most uh, most school sites, you likely have a very limited budget and some of you may be doing these things already. Um, but as a as a kind of a reminder, here are some things that, that we came up with. So if you're uh, looking to get a donation from a vendor, it's really helpful to purchase a few things before you ask. That way you let the vendor know like, hey, I'm a customer, I come here frequently, would love to also see if we can get any donations. Um, you know, using uh, photos to tell your story is incredibly helpful. It can be as simple as having a photo album on your phone. So when you're at a place, you can show pictures of what you're up to or what you're planning, um, or you can get fancy and print it and create almost like a lookbook to bring with you. Um, I encourage asking for gently used tools on social media. Um, I know in the area of Florida that I'm in, uh, a lot of folks after a while don't want to continue maintaining their, their home space. And so they're getting rid of tools and things and social media is a great place to ask for those items. If you're in need of seeds, um, oftentimes local vendors are receiving new inventory or they have seeds that are close to expiration. I encourage you to ask for those because they might just be getting thrown away. When it comes to soil and amendments, broken bags are fantastic. This is actually a picture from my own garden and I purchased half of those bags and half of them are actually broken that I got for free. So the vendor, when I was picking them up um, after I purchased them said, hey, would you like some of these broken bags? Absolutely. So sometimes they're free, sometimes they're offered at a discount. Um, Landscaping companies will sometimes offer mulch, which is great um, if you are in need of that. And big, big box stores have discount programs. So if you're checking out and you want to find out about that, sometimes the cashier doesn't know. So make sure you head to the pro desk area or uh, ask a manager um, because oftentimes they know if there's a discount for nonprofits, for a school, et cetera. We know oftentimes with, um, with grants, they require paperwork and upkeep with that. So just as a reminder, when you're purchasing things, um, schools are going to be tax exempt. So you should not have to pay tax um, and make sure you have your tax exempt form with you. Sites online oftentimes allow you to upload that online so you're not paying tax. And to keep track of your receipts, there's a app called uh, Genius Scan that you can use. It allows you to track those and keep track of those in-kind uh, donations like broken bags. To help make this a little bit easier for you all, um, we created kind of a, a toolbox. And so there are three uh, things that we have for you um, that will hopefully help if you're reaching out to a new partner and I know you all are busy. So this um, includes a fillable brochure. So this is a screenshot here of it and you can put the name of your school in, you can have your contact information, add um, who you are and what your, your garden program is all about. And this way you can print it in color or black and white. And it's something that you can send 
or um, bring with you if you're you're going out and seeking donation or looking to, to build a new partner. We also created a event flyer template. Um, and this is for events that you may be having, a harvesting party, maintenance. And um, this is also fillable to use as well. Both of these templates are through a program called Canva. So if you haven't used Canva before, it will require you to make a account, which I know we have 8 million accounts, but create one because it's free. You can fill this in if you don't already have a, a flyer that you can use and add your information in. And lastly, we have a um, email templates that you can uh, use to copy and paste and put in for your ask. So whether it's physical donation, whether it's an ask to a partner that has um, technical support, you need hands in the garden or for an event invitation. And these will all be on our Google Drive as well, as well as they're in the chat box. So a couple of um, spotlights that I'd love to share with you around um, what community partners look like around the state. Um, we can go to the next slide. So down in Miami-Dade, and I believe we have uh, Mrs. Claudia Chatterton here with us at Avocado Elementary. Um, she has worked with the Education Fund in Miami and had originally taken a garden class with them. And as a result of taking this class, ended up partnering with them, starting with a, a small garden, and now it's growing into a full food forest. So the Education Fund has provided materials and garden lessons, and even during COVID has been able to provide support. So some of the advice that she shares is giving back. So their original garden that started out with raised beds are now being donated to the Green Haven Project because they are transitioning into this food forest and so able to donate to another site that is wanting to do a garden as well. And she also recommends asking. People want to give. So go ahead and put yourself out there and see what you can maybe get. Here in Manatee County, which is where I am at um, Sug Middle School, the um, teacher, Mrs. Um, uh, Kimberly Lowe, uh, has been teaching for many years. And one of the previous sites she was at, uh, her garden got vandalized, which was really unfortunate. And a whole news article came out. But the positive part is that as a result of this news article coming out, United Way saw that they needed help, they needed people to clean up. So this was almost 10 years ago. And as a result of that, for the last 10 years, she has continued to develop this partnership with United Way. And so United Way um, now has their, has a monthly volunteer maintenance for the school site up on their website. Volunteers can see it on their calendar sign up with a waiver online and once a month volunteers come and help to maintain the garden during after school hours on the weekends. So uh, she likes to share on social media and has a yearly banquet to thank all of the, uh, the volunteers that come throughout the year. So the advice um, that she recommends is making sure of course you've got ad admin approval, um, creating touch points, like sending emails, posting on social media, and always, always bring snacks. All right, next slide. And lastly, at Estero High School in Lee County, uh, this is a student-led uh, program, and it's the Estero Green Team. And the students have reached out to multiple local horticultural businesses, as well as other organizations. And they reached out wanting to get um, advice around how to grow and what they wanted to do at their, at their school. And so they recommend that you, know, you start building partnerships before even constructing anything, really kind of getting an idea around those um, garden plans with partners that are able to offer advice and technical assistance. And much like the others, staying connected on social media, inviting partners to events and offering tours so they can see what you're up to. All right, thanks Emily for sharing your advice and expertise and also for sharing what's going on around the state. It's always fun to see those spotlights. 
And so just a quick wrap up uh, before we move into our Q&A. Here's our three categories that we touched on today. And for gardening knowledge, we wanna make sure that we're scouting early and often to prevent any of those pests from taking hold in our garden. Prevention is key for managing disease in the garden. And Molly talked about some awesome ideas for how to do that. We wanna make sure we're planning ahead, you know, considering what will our garden require based on the seasonal changes, whether that's really hot, really cold, trellising, frost cloth mulch, et cetera. And in the category of curriculum connections, we recommend hands-on garden maintenance with students, uh, you know, interactive outdoor activities and experiential learning. Many hands make light work is something I always like to encourage using the students as a learning tool and also to help with that maintenance and invite curiosity about the wonderful world of bugs because it does connect to so many uh, educational topics and teaching standards. And lastly, the health of our garden programs are only as strong as the health of our relationships as Emily touched on. So be sure to maintain those community partnerships with reciprocity in mind, not just what you can get from them, but what you can get, give back and express gratitude often. So we're gonna move into our Q&A networking, but if you can't stick around, we encourage you to please do our short three minute session survey. We'll have the link in the chat box here. Uh, we also have, like I said, CEUs available and our PD link uh, for that will be in the chat box as well. We encourage you to stay in touch via our Facebook group. The password is Cuban Oregano and you can join that. And then also all of these resources, slides and video recordings will be available in our Google Drive folder. So thank you to our presenters uh, this session. It was awesome to hear from all three of you and they'll all be available. And next month on January 27th, we will be talking about seed saving uh, and a lot of other fun activities and topics. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Selena and she's gonna facilitate our Q&A session. And we'll watch that video as well, but I wanna make sure we answer any immediate questions first. Hi, Tiffany, thank you for um, bringing up the questions. Thank you all so much for um, sharing in the chat. We actually have one question um, which was asked and unanswered about um, stink bugs and tomatoes. And this question um, was, do stink bugs eat tomatoes? So um, I see this question here, the stink bugs eat, do eat um, steam bugs eat tomatoes or squash. There's actually an insect called the Florida leaf bug um, that is uh, very common and some people debate whether or not to call them stink bugs. They are, you know, sap suckers. They are plant suckers and um, they are also known as a helmeted squash bug. So yes, there are stink bugs that eat squash and they're not necessarily the, uh, the ones that i obviously not the ones I was referring to, but there are some that do, and those are pretty obvious. Um, they look more like very large um, leaf-footed bugs. I wish I, I actually almost included an image of them, but they are just not as much of an issue for the small garden. So I just, I didn't include them, um, but I do think they're one of the coolest bugs. <laughs> um, they are stinky, just like normal stink bugs. Um, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else has another comment on them, but I personally feel that you can probably just move them out of your garden and be fine, personally. Yeah, there, there, and there are, um, there are predatory stink bugs and they tend to have like the sharp um, spikes on their shoulders, but a lot of the stink bugs um, will also be kind of the rounded shouldered ones will have um, a, a sucking mouth part and a piercing. So they'll basically they'll stick their proboscis into a tomato and suck the juices right out of it. Um, so the predatory stink bugs will eat other insects, but the, um, a lot of the ones you'll find are in your tomatoes are the ones that are going to be able to suck those juices and, and they'll damage your tomato and it'll make it taste kind of funny. They'll leave a hard spot on your tomato, but they are very hard to control. Um, so it's, you really got to just try to keep them to, to handpick them um, and scout your garden regularly to try to control them. 
I'm going to add that. That's a good point, actually. The, the way you can tell the difference between stink bugs um, and armored stink bugs or assassin bugs is usually they will have pointy elbows or shoulders, you could say. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so much. We're very lucky today to have Molly Jameson and Jenna Miller here to be able to answer these um, technical questions about insects that um, I feel like a lot of people we all have these questions and um, it's nice to be able to get some technical expertise here today. So um, I think those were actually all the questions we had. Um, okay, we have a new question. Could you share more about the beneficial insects in gardens? Um, I definitely could speak for a very long time about beneficial bugs in gardens. Uh, is there any specific topic you would like to speak of? Hi, Jana. No, this is Emily. I'm just really curious because we didn't get a chance to cover it. I know an hour is, is, uh, is a bit short for us to get into it. So I would love if you don't mind highlighting um, maybe a few beneficial bugs that we should all keep in mind when we're at the garden. Like I'm thinking ladybugs, but I'm, I know there's more out there. So one thing about ladybugs that I like to share is that um, most of the ladybugs that we'll see in Florida are going to be um, non-native, which hasn't necessarily shown to be negative for ecosystems just yet. But um, you can also see people will encourage online to um, buy and release ladybugs in your garden. And that is definitely an option, but um, just keep in mind that they're not going to be native. And um, I would just keep in, uh, keep in mind that that could be detrimental in the future for the ecosystem. We just have not proven that yet, but they are very good to have around. And whenever you see any kind of like crawling um, orange and black looking creature that looks kind of like a weird larvae with, with three extended legs, that's actually the larva of a ladybug and they're um, very prolific aphid hunters as well. So just make sure to learn about the bugs in your garden. Feel free to reach out to me on my Instagram. I love to ID folks, like um, bugs if anyone wants to send me pictures. And I can tell you whether or not something is beneficial or not. Because there's just so many species, it's really hard to keep track of everything. Jenna, isn't there a lookalike as well? Some, there's something similar to a ladybug? Well, so there, so there is, um, I was going to mention briefly that there are things like um, potato beetles. Um, potato beetles can kind of resemble a ladybug because they are a type of leaf beetle. Um, so people might confuse those, but um, they're pretty distinctive um, in, in my opinion, the difference in them. But there are like probably, I mean, there's just a, an amazing amount of species of ladybugs, especially in Florida. And there are also um, a type of leaf beetle called tortoise beetles. They're one of my favorites. And you may actually see those on um, your uh, morning glories and other types of bindweed. And sometimes you might see them on your nightshades, which are gonna be um, tomatoes and whatnot. And they typically don't cause enough harm to really do anything to your plant. They don't eat any of um, the vegetation. Um, they are in such small numbers, they generally won't harm anything. And I would classify them as visitors instead of pests in a garden. But, um, that's yeah, what I definitely that. think of as, as um, ones that look probably too similar. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I love teaching about all the stages of the life cycle of the ladybugs in particular, because you know students aren't accustomed to seeing the teenager, the ugly teenager <laughs> ladybug, right? And you might squish it. And it's again, another one of these yeah. ways to think about empathy, social emotional yeah. learning, compassion in the garden, so. And may I actually mention something this question I just saw in the chat? Um, so what I personally did for my toddler as his beginning garden was, um, was t uh, potato plants because when you harvest them, it's basically like a sensory garden. The, the, the vines die back and then you're just left with dirt full of potatoes that the kids can just go rummage around in and it's so easy. And I mean, they just completely take care of themselves in our area. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much. So um, those were all the questions. The, that was the last question was, what's the be best beginning garden to start out with for pre-K students? And I love that I, suggestion for potatoes. If anyone else um, wants to share, maybe should we do that now or Tiffany? Um, yes, if anyone else has suggestions for beginning gardens for pre-K students, we'd love to hear from all of you around the state what um, your experience and we have, I believe from Mrs. Chatterton, a pizza garden. Mrs. Chatterton, um, that sounds delicious and fun. Emily asks, what is in your pizza garden? Would you be able to share some more, Mrs. Chatterton? Yes, I will do that right now. So we took a small box and did, um, tried to make it a little more round with the concrete blocks. And then we sectioned it off basil, tomato, peppers, oregano. And so they could harvest all that for their pizza. Those are um, some of my favorite plants. Um, that, that's amazing that you were able to grow them all the way to harvest and then eat them in a pizza. Um, so we have another suggestion from Susan Hassett, green beans. We made Jack and the Beanstalk creating a castle with milk cartons and beans growing out of them. And the story was used too. That is so cool. Um, thank you for sharing. A question from Emily, has anyone played any games in the garden to identify bugs? And if so, which ones? We would love to hear from all of you if you have, um, Yes, activities in which you engage your students in the garden to identify um, identify insects. Well, I guess um, in our bug club for in Leon County, um, we have the kids collect as many bugs as they can. And for each bug of a different family, we'll have it set that they will win a certain amount of points. And then we do kind of a point system to accumulate who gets like the grand prize is the bug catcher of the day. And we usually keep um, a bug identification book with us um, so that we can look it up together and show the kids how to do that as well. That sounds really fun. Thank you, Jen. Um, so I think we don't have any questions coming in right now. Tiffany, do you want to um, share the video now? Sure, I can go ahead and switch that over. Can someone confirm that they're seeing it properly? Can I get a verbal yes? <laughs> Yep, I yeah, see the video. Um, okay, it's just small. So if you're able yeah. to widen your screen, I yep. think it'll be good. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the way we uploaded it was um, it's a little fuzzy, but great information. So I'll go ahead. Hi, my name is Jana Miller, and I'm a volunteer with 4-H at the UF IFAS Extension Office in Leon County, Florida. We're here today to talk about pest management and control for the school gardener. We're going to talk today about how to search for pests specifically. When I'm looking for pests and their damage, I try to look for leaves specifically that have circular holes in them or what I call skeletization. Skeletization means uh, plant fibers that have been eaten away and maybe translucent or see-through or maybe have turned brown at some point. For example, on the plants we have At this stage, because they're so small, this is called a first instar, you'll see the skeleton with the translucent damage on the underside of the leaf, followed by holes that from older instars of uh, this caterpillar. 
When I find a leaf with particular damage, I will decide whether or not the plant can survive uh, by removing the, plant, the, the, the damaged leaf entirely. We don't want to remove too many leaves from a plant because you want to ensure that the, the plant can continue photosynthesis and this plant particularly is something we want to be able to harvest. Whenever I try to pull a leaf from the plant itself, I do it from the base of the plant as close as possible because any remaining leaf fibers could rot and encourage more pests and more damage to come to the plant. An easy way to remove the plant is to take a simple pair of scissors and go against the, the stalk itself and remove as much as you can. On this table, I have collected some examples of damage you may see on your leafy greens. The largest leaf here has seen some significant damage and has varying degrees of damage. Holes in leaves are the biggest giveaway when it comes to finding pests on your plants. Especially leafy greens, since we actually will be eating this part of the plant. I wouldn't be afraid to go ahead and remove the leaf entirely if damage is significant, but make sure to keep enough of the plant so that the plant will survive. Other damage you may see may be smaller and harder to view. This is the skeletonization that I spoke of. This leaf here has damage from early instar loopers. This probably occurred over just a day or two. As infestations happen quickly and can decimate a plant leaf very quickly. Seen here under magnification is the early instar of a looper caterpillar. Loopers are a type of moth and a very common pest experienced on cabbage um, and other types of brassica, which includes uh, Brussels sprouts, broccoli. Uh, kale, really any leafy green you can think of. Um, they are a very common pest in the winter and may be seen all year round in Florida. Also viewed under magnification, we have aphids on this collard green. School garden maintenance is a fantastic opportunity to put the learning experience in your students' hands. When doing so, remember, we do not simply want to teach the kids to destroy any pests they encounter. We want to teach compassion and um, empathy for the creatures. So an alternative to simply killing the pests you encounter, especially when students are involved, you could actually capture them into a critter carrier and take them into the classroom and rear them into adulthood. That would be a good ex learning experience. Alternatively, you could feed them to classroom pe um, pets such as uh, chameleons, lizards, anything that really eats uh, worms, super worms. Uh, they will also feed on caterpillars. A uh, third option is to put the pests in a designated location far from your garden. When you send your kids out into the garden, a fun tool is magnifying glasses. That way they can search and point out pests and simply not remove them at all and then you can choose what to do later. I personally like to examine my bugs later and I like to take them into critter carriers and watch them grow into adults. Um, have fun out there and happy gardening! Thank you, that was an awesome video. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left together for um, the, our networking time together and we would love if anyone has questions or wants to share on um, methods you've found successful when dealing with pests and diseases in your garden, um, or an example of a partnership that you are proud of at your site that you would like to share about, um, ways of maintaining your partnerships, um, any questions you have, now is your time to ask and share together. So. Does anyone have any questions or things they would like to share?
Well, I'd just like to go ahead and tell everybody, I encourage you to um, ask people, they will give you money. We are so thankful here at Avocado. The Rotary Club just came out yesterday and they're gonna do our outdoor classroom. We asked. So people love children and they want to help. So I encourage you to make some partners, make some friends and ask because they will, they will, they will give if they can. So best of luck to everybody. Thank you so much, Mrs. Chatterton for sharing about all the great partnerships at Avocado Elementary School. Um, many of which I got to hear from Mrs. Chatterton in more detail about. Um, Mrs. Chatterton has asked, um, or even she was, is it okay if I share Mrs. Chatterton, your story about Greenhaven Project? Um, she was telling me she, she read a news article about um, an amazing community garden project and then reached out to the organization and had them come to the school and then, um, ended up donating some of some of the materials from the school even to this organization. And, um, and yes, great advice to reach out and ask. A garden is a great way of bringing everyone together. Um, we have some in the chat from Breton. Um, thank you so much, Breton, for sharing. He says, in my Peace Corps days, we looked up organic recipes to help prevent bugs from eating plants. And be sure to contact your county extension offices for help with IPM. Um, they will always, almost always figure out the solutions to the problems. This is true. Um, we have many specialists around the state um, in, in all counties. Your local I IFAS extension agent is a great place to ask your questions about bugs. Yeah, I know we've shared this in the past, but oftentimes the Master Gardener program is a great resource for identification. So if you just bring in that damaged leaf or something like that to the office, they'll get back to you and email a response and then a whole research-based document about what it is, the valid ID, and then what some possible solutions are. And some extension offices will even do site visits as well to school gardens. So definitely reach out to your local resources. Well, I just wanted to chime in. All I meant with the organic recipe was like in the Peace Corps, we'd mix water with like fermented garlic or something weird like that. And it would chase away certain bugs we didn't want on the plant. So sometimes there's weird alternate methods that work really well. Definitely. And that's a fun way to get creative with kids too. And I know we, we had a whole conversation about iguanas in the past, so I don't want to dive deeper into that, but thinking about, you know, not just our bug pests, but our other pests that we want to keep away too. There might be some solutions that are like that. I can share a little bit about um, other pests. Um, last year at my, so my community garden spot, I was having holes that were dug in. They were about this round and about this deep and really had a hard time figuring out what was getting into it. So I ended up using animal urine, uh, which you can purchase in pelleted form, I think in other forms as well. So I put that around the perimeter. Um, the only challenge was because I had a, a watering system, um, it didn't last very long. So I had to kind of keep going back um, or turning off the watering system that I had and then putting the, the urine down. It was a bit odd, it helped, um, it didn't eliminate it and I still could never figure out what it was because of the size that they were, maybe squirrels, I'm not sure, but um, animal urine is, is I thought a little odd, but it, it, it can, it can help, um, and definitely doesn't damage any of the plants. I didn't put it on anything just around the perimeter as if I was marking it. Thank you Emily, for sharing. Does anyone else, um, want to share any of their tips for managing pests? Or diseases you've encountered? Or if, um, if you would like to share anything else, we have five minutes left together or um, 
if you feel satisfied with all your questions and sharing, then um, we can end the session. And thank you all so very much for sharing and um, all, to all the presenters and all the garden leaders and participants. Thank you all. Thanks, Selena. We hope to see you all on January 27th. So have a, a wonderful end of the, the year and we will we'll see you in January.